on the timing of the meeting. Um, so I do apologize for any inconvenience um, and are happy that um, you were all able to join us. Community linkage sessions, um, or any linkage sessions we do is a chance for the board to interact with either a special, a specific group or, or in this case, our entire community, whoever would like to participate. Due to the constraints with um, all remote meetings, um, we have modified it a bit to um, request emails um, from anyone who had wanted to address an issue and um, we're going to, we've, we've gone through them and Maggie Ty's gonna explain in a little bit exactly how she did that, but we went through them, consolidated them and, um, and we'll be presenting questions and uh, looking to our superintendent and her staff for answers. Um, before we do that, I wanted to take the opportunity to um, have board directors address um, specific, some specific issues that I think might be beneficial for uh, all of us, um, just a clear understanding in terms of um, where we are, information we rely on, what the board, what type of governance the board has, um, and what the board is doing with regards to advocacy in the community during this um, global pandemic. So um, first up, I have asked, sorry, just looking around at different windows here. I have asked uh, Director D'Souza to give a um, brief uh, uh, explanation of policy governance. Um, so David, please take it away. Sure. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you to all the participants for attending this community linkage. Uh, policy governance uh, describes the way the board and the superintendent uh, work together. School districts are very heavily regulated by a lot of legal governance and legal legislation that defines how we do things, how we spend money, how boards interoperate with their superintendent. Policy governance is the way we bring together the legal side of what we need to do, as well as the mission, vision, and values of our school district into one way of thinking about how we work with our superintendent. And uh, as anyone who's um, worked with professionals and great people, you know you shouldn't be in the position of micromanaging. And policy governance uh, helps the board separate what it does at a high goal level, what are the goals, what's the vision, what's the mission, from what the educators and administration does, which is how we educate our kids and what we're going to do to achieve the goals that the uh, board sets out. And some of the key concepts around this include uh, assuming best intentions, so on, on both sides that we assume people are adhering to the mission, vision, and values of the district whenever they do anything. Another key concept is that the board will, uh, will, will, support, will support the best intentions of the superintendent. And in many cases, there are many different decisions that can be made, and we won't micromanage those decisions that the superintendent and her staff decide to make, make at the end of the day, as long as they're meeting the goals that the board sets out to do. So at a high level, um, our board about 20 years ago decided to follow this policy governance route. It has allowed us to have a very stable relationship with the school district, our community, and our superintendent and educators and has allowed us to have an excellent performing school system. So this board has continued uh, that tradition and any board could actually change the way they govern, but we've, uh, we've kept it because it's worked for such a long time. Uh, other key concepts you'll hear us talk about in board meetings are fundamentals. Uh, are the fundamentals, which are the, the legal requirement that we tell the superintendent ahead of time what we'll be uh, grading her on or him on. Uh, and there's a lot more detail into it, but that's the gist. So with that, I'll turn it back to Deborah. Thank you. 
Thank you, Brian. Um, I realize typically in linkage sessions, I have um, the board introduce themselves and um, with your position, how long you've been on the board and um, if you have, well, we all have children in the district, um, what ages your children are in the district, just so the community can get an idea of what our um, personal background is. So David, do you wanna, and I'm gonna have everyone do that at the time that you start your speaking. So David, I missed you, if you could. Sure. Uh, I've, got, I've had three kids go through the district. Two of them are now in college, and I've got a third one in high school. And this is your serving yourself? Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is my uh, second term on the board, so it's been about five years now. Thank you so much. All right, and thank you for that explanation. Um, next, we are going to hear from Director Janini Upton with regards to statewide advocacy. Thank you, President Lurie. Um, so I'm Brian Janini Upton. I've been on the board three years now, so I'm three years into my first term. And my wife and I have an incoming Islander middle school student. Yay! Um, and we just got our schedule today, so we're very excited. Cool. Um, so <laughs> I'm also serving as the legislative representative for the board at the moment, um, and have been since December when we reorganize the board every year. Um, so part of my job as a legislative representative is to work with the board as a liaison between what we do here and the legislative committee with the Washington State School Directors Association, which is the professional organization that represents all elected school board uh, directors within the state of Washington, which is over 1,400 elected officials. So one of the largest groups of elected officials, but certainly the largest that advocates on behalf of children. Um, so I also happen to be elected as a director area two representative on that legislative committee. Uh, it makes up roughly King County and it covers 20 school districts and a third of all students in the state of Washington. So it's a very powerful group. Um, and the legislative committee itself represents all 11 districts across the state of Washington and the, uh, I guess 1.2 million students in the state of Washington. Um, so our Outreach um, begins, and we're going to start this process here very soon with our board, at a local level of looking at the legislative positions uh, and permanent positions within the suite offered to us through the Washington State School Directors Association. Our association then advocates on our behalf throughout the year and throughout the legislative sessions, uh, but then also provides us resources to interact and advocate locally. One of those examples is every week right now, and, and for several months now, there's been a networking call that happens through WASDA every Thursday where we're updated on all the recent information coming out from OSPA, uh, OSPI, the State Board of Education, the Governor's Office, um, King County Public Health, Washington State Public Health, all of those organizations. Um, Mercer Island School District also has partnered with four regional school districts, North Shore, Bellevue, Issaquah, and Lake Washington. And we've been working together for a couple of months now um, as our superintendents do, uh, to really focus on issues that pertain to our students in this area. And these five school districts represent um, a significant, about 10% of all students in the state of Washington. So through those meetings, we have been meeting now with King County Public Health, with Washington State Public Health, with um, the county council's office, uh, the county executive's office, and others to try to press for um, our needs within this area. And we've now expanded that work to include all of King County um, over two meetings over the last four days, roughly. Um, then beyond that, we work at the Federal Relations Network level uh, through the National School Boards Association, where we reach out to our partners, uh, that would be Congressman Adam Smith and Senators Murray and Cantwell. Um, I get to sit in on a conversation with the superintendent later this week with um, Count, uh, Congressman Smith. Uh, where she's going to be talking specifically about Mercer Island's issues and advocating on our behalf. Um, and so there's a ton of work that's happening and a ton of resources that are provided back to the five of us in order to help make our decisions and inform our work. Um, the last thing I would touch on are some of the key things that we've been advocating for over the past several months are testing and tracing from King County to Washington State Public Health. Um, tracing of who has antibodies, uh, getting a benchmark for that now so that we can get another benchmark in a few months to see what sort of spread has happened within schools once they've opened. 
Um, also the availability of tracing who has the infection um, and contact tracing should it occur within our school districts. Um, we've been advocating for the availability of testing and quick testing, quick turnaround times, as well as guidelines and how to assess risk because nothing is truly safe at the moment. So we have to assess levels of risk, whether it's low, medium or high risk. Um, and so we've really been advocating for King County and Washington State to give us a matrix of exactly what that looks like. And the recent information that has come out uh, from Washington State, I believe is in direct relation to the advocacy work that we have been participating in. Um, emerging issues are around childcare. We know that childcare is an issue and we're beginning to speak at the council level, at the county level, as well as the state level on that. And then apportionment, um, transportation funding, and of course, at the federal level, we continue to advocate for full funding of IDEA, which is the Individual Disabilities and Education Act, which is mandated and is absolutely the right thing to do, but has never been fully funded by the federal government. So we continue to press at that level for the government at the federal level to fully fund IDEA so that our states can fully fund special education across Washington for all students. So, that's my big plug and that of course is the tip of the iceberg um, i'm really proud to advocate on behalf of the school district i'm certainly available to all of our board directors if they have questions or want to run information uh, up the flagpole to other organizations and i'm continually reaching out to the superintendent and her staff to get background information that helps to inform our advocacy work at the state level i think that covers it Thank you very much, Director Janini Upman, and thank you for the, your involvement in the outside organizations, which goes, um, I mean, it's a part of our work, but it does also go above and beyond. So thank you for that. Um, next, we are going to go to Director Tucker, who is going to talk about um, metrics we are using with regards to the COVID pandemic. Okay, thanks for that perfect lead in uh, to Director Janini. Oh, am I Okay, you're Thank on, you. but inter don't forget to oh, sorry, introduce myself. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is my first year of my first term. My name is Maggie Ty Tucker, and I am a pediatric occupational therapist by trade. I have three children in the district, two rising juniors and one rising second grader. So uh, I was just saying thank you for the perfect lead in to Director Janini Upton because that matrix that he was talking about that, that we've been advocating for and that, that these groups that we're part of have been advocating for um, came out last week on the 5th and that is um, called the Decision Tree for Provision of In-Person Learning and you can find it on the, it's linked to from one of the presentations that's been posted on the Mercer Island School District website, but you can also find it if you just Google OSPI decision tree, um, you will find it. And that will get you a really nice thorough document that explains kind of what, um, what public health sources of information they're drawing on in, in um, setting these parameters for us um, statewide, setting these parameters for, for all school districts statewide, but also it's full of references to different articles and stuff. So we, some of the, the emails that we got were asking, well, what is this based on? It's all in here. Like there's some great, great resources in here. And then at the end of it, there is this, um, and I know that that uh, we saw this last week, that Superintendent Kolaski sort of showed it in the air last week, but it's really worth taking a look at because um, one of the questions that had a couple of people sent in was, do these categories of high, medium, low risk correlate directly to the colors in our, in our plan for kind of like red learning, orange learning, yellow learning? The answer is absolutely not, no. So, um, the, the categories are, are set based on the number of new cases per 100,000 people over a two week period. And so if you look at this chart, what, what you do is you first determine, and anyone can determine by looking at the county by county data, um, which is linked off the OSPI website, um, you first determine like which of these categories are you in. And then when you are um, at a category that is like moderate to low risk, um, you know, and the, the state and state public health officials will be making recommendations about when it might be considered possible to go back to school in person um, in some group capacity, right? Um, then that triggers like a next portion of the decision tree. And the next portion of the decision tree has to do with what resources do you have available? What is the spacing? Can you keep the six feet distance between students? 
um, and students and teachers? Do you have enough equipment, you know, et cetera? And then that then triggers um, another decision tree, which is, you know, is the school and is the health healthcare system, are they, are they both ready to be monitoring the, the health of students and be ready to respond to a potential COVID outbreak? And so only when you've kind of got like a green light on all of the, the relevant factors, can you then begin in-person learning on other than just a one-by-one -one kind of basis. So, um, so this is a really helpful thing, I think, for parents to see so that they, they understand some of kind of what's going on behind the scenes as, as people are making these decisions. And it was very helpful, I think, for our district to receive it because we've, we've all along been, the district has all along been asking, you know, asking for and receiving advice from King County Public Health, which has been fantastic, and from OSPI and from the state public health officials. But, you know, to have every district in the in the state doing that independently doesn't really make sense. It's much better to have this kind of like consistent statewide matrix being applied that is at the same time responsive based on the level of disease outbreak in that county. So that's that. Um, the, uh, the, there's lots in this document, if anyone takes the time to read it, there's lots in this document about kind of, you know, what, what philosophies the, the state is using to try to keep both students and their families and staff and the general community safe and healthy, right? Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that at, at one of these um, WASDA statewide meetings that Director Janini Upton mentioned last week, um, the executive director Tim Garcho, Garcho, Garcho <laughs> mentioned that um, Garcho mentioned that um, that he had had talked to uh, the three insurance companies that provide insurance for almost every school district in Washington State, and that they uniformly said that they would not cover claims that resulted in a school district kind of going rogue off of this plan and exceeding the safe level of back to school allowed for by this matrix. And so if we were to do, if any district was to do that, they would be out there on their own. And if there were claims, of course, um, sorry, if there were claims settled against them, that money would be coming out of our, you know, general education fund. That would be impacting everyone's education. So just something to keep in mind. That's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Perfect timing. I was just going to give you the warning, but thank you so much. Um, I've asked people to limit their comments to a certain time so that we can get through all the information we want to today. So um, next we have Director Din, who I've asked to talk about upcoming events and deadlines and everything logistically important that we have scheduled now. Um, and please start off with your introduction. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tam Din, and this is my first year, my first term. Uh, I have three boys, uh, a rising third grader at Northwood and uh, a rising sixth grader uh, at IMS and an eighth grader at IMS. So they're driving me crazy. Uh, so I'm, I look forward to getting them back in school. So since that you, everybody's at their computer right now, I invite you to go on to the website and Google in like mercerislandschools.org. Well, type it in, uh, slash fall 2020. There on the website, you have um, all the information that you need uh, with uh, connection to our board meetings, uh, our board presentation, and uh, communication from the superintendent. It also provides you with information on the different uh, learning phases. And then on your uh, side of the website, there's all the upcoming events. So this is really helpful for you to keep track of and see where you can participate uh, in this process. So what we have coming up, you know, in August 12th is a special uh, board special meeting. And then I think what parents would really be interested in is the Zoom uh, Q&A for families on MI Online at 6.30 on, uh, tomorrow. And then there will be a regular board meeting on the 13th. And then we'll also have a special education parent webinar on the um, 19th. And then it also goes out toward a couple of days in the first uh, week of September for you to, you know, just to know what uh, is happening in uh, the district. So if you don't find the information that you need on this website, you know, you can always uh, email the superintendent and also email the board for any further clarification. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Director Den. Um, and uh, please assume that um, while things might, while the events might look different this year, events are happening back to school and welcomes, and we're doing our best to proceed um, with as much community as possible. It's just going to look a little different. So things are being planned as we speak, and things are added to the calendar, I'm sure, almost daily. So please. Um, Check that out and, and thank you, Tam, for pointing us to that website. Ann Reeves did um, link it in the chat. Um, bookmark it so that you have uh, easy access to that. Um, before I talk about my things, I'm gonna ask our um, two student representatives to introduce themselves and I'm gonna ask Paul, I'm looking for you, Paul, I didn't move. There you are, okay, sorry, on my screen, you moved. Um, I'm gonna ask Paul to describe, go first and describe what um, a student representative does on the school board. Okay, so I'm Paul Noon and I'm the senior student representative. I served as a junior last year, since so my second year. I don't have any children in the district. Um, uh, and so pretty much as like a student representative, uh, to keep it short, uh, we pretty much advocate for student voice across the district. So. We spend a lot of time gathering input from students from kindergarten all the way through the high school and kind of share, share their voice uh, at lots of committee meetings, a lot of the school board meetings, and kind of just uh, give input to the adults in the room from what the students are thinking. Thank you, Paul. And Morgan? Hi, I'm Morgan. I'm the rising junior student representative and I'm pretty brand new um, here. So I'm still kind of learning um, from Paul, like what the role of a representative is, but I'm definitely just providing kind of student perspective is um, I think the main goal that I have. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Morgan, for joining us. She actually isn't even officially on the job yet until our first meeting in September. So thank you for joining us. Paul and Morgan have been joining us for many of these meetings um, this summer and have been um, involved on some committees and we really value their voice. Um, I want to, so I'm, my name's Deborah Lurie. I'm uh, the president of the school board this year. It is my um, third, end of third year, right? Um, on the board, same as Director Janini Upton, however long that's been. Um, none of us planned on, um, being on the board um, during a global pandemic. So this has thrown us all for a loop and we are getting through it as best as we can. Um, on that note, I would just wanted to talk about a couple of things and then the rest of the time, don't worry, we'll be going to um, questions that you have asked. Um, I want to direct, and Andrews, if you could link this, I did not give him a heads up, so give him a minute. Board policy 4020, 4020, it's mutual respect and civility. As Director D'Souza stated, um, the, one, of the, one of the main roles for the school board is to develop policy and uh, determine priorities for um, our, our student body. And um, as part of that, um, the board has developed, um, actually recently in the last couple of years, developed a mutual respect and civility policy. Um, we, all know that um, we all do the best that we can and during times um, especially of stress and anxiety um, sometimes we all forget these so I just wanted to take a moment um, to have us all look at the mutual respect and civility that was adopted on October 25th 2018 and this is with regards to um, frankly all interactions that happen within the district um, and I'm just gonna highlight a couple of the things, but um, I'm sure Andrews is um, linking it if he hasn't already. Um, the, uh, ones that I wanted to highlight um, are to keep the best interest of our students first. As you all know, in our, in our um, mission, or in our values, um, students are the priority. Students are the priority. Oh, thank you so much, Andrews. Um, students are the priority, and um, we make every decision um, based on that um, value. Uh, we another issue or another um, one that I want to bring to everyone's attention is number the second bullet point. Go to the source of the concern 
when confronted with a problem or someone who is in position to address the concern. Um, as again, Director Janini, I'm uh, uh, sorry, Director Souza explained to us about policy governance. Um, the board really is um, responsible for policy um, approving and monitoring the budget and then overseeing our superintendent. Our superintendent is in charge of all operations um, and then she delegates her authority to um, the her administrative team, her leadership team, and the school principal, which includes the school principals, and then the school principals down to the not down to, but to the classroom teacher and and the person. When I say down to, that that has the closest contact um, with the information. So we really, really encourage um, the community to reach out to the person um, closest to the concern. Um, not only because it is. Uh, re respectful to do that, but also we believe that that person's in the best position to address the concern. Um, if we, if you don't know who that is, that's okay. Reach out to whoever it is, and then we will forward that um, your concern um, or problem to the appropriate person. So, so asking who it is is certainly not a problem. But um, we want to we value the professionalism of our classroom teachers. And for any questions that you might have with regards to what's happening in the classroom, we strongly encourage you and, and frankly have created this policy so that um, we all go to the classroom teacher first um, and hopefully your concern can be addressed there. And if not, then, then it can go further, but, but that's where we want it to go. Our teachers are our educational experts and we rely on that to make, we rely on them to make um, the best decisions. We realize that it's frustrating right now because there's so many changes and, um, and uh, you don't necessarily, in fact, you don't know who your classroom teacher is. I didn't know that the middle school schedules went out today. So now you've got the middle schoolers have some, have some stu uh, names that they can reach out to. But um, in the meantime, if it's, if it's individual questions, reach out to your principal. If the principal isn't the right um, person, they will direct it to someone who can help you. Um, and so, it's just, we um, appreciate your assistance and cooperation with that. Um, the, sorry, I'm going from screen to screen. Second, sorry, lost my document. There it is, okay. Um, so that is what I wanted to point out. I encourage everyone to read Board Policy 4020. Um, it isn't particularly long um, and it really does kind of explain. We, we appreciate and um, respect all of our, um, the, the parent participation, student participation, staff participation, and this just puts us all on the same page. Um, I want to let everyone know that um, we are working in addition to our learning forward teams, um, the administration and building uh, staff are working on um, back to school information. You will be hearing from your schools um, and then teachers as time goes on. Um, keep in mind, it's only August 11th. I know we've got a tremendous amount of anxiety because of the unknown. Um, but things are getting planned as we speak and as they're planned and they're ready to roll out, um, that information is getting communicated to families. So it certainly is okay to ask about it, but please just assume that all of these events that we normally have that welcome us back to the new school year are happening. Um, it's just gonna look a little bit different. Um, I know that elementary uh, principals and associate principals have already um, started sending out Zoom uh, or you know, short little webinars um, about different topics, one of which they mentioned school supplies. So all this information is going to be coming. If it's something you feel like you need an answer to immediately, um, feel free to reach out to your building um, staff. Um, we understand that this is a challenging time for all of us. Um, it is with uh, tremendous gratitude um, that I want to thank our parent volunteers um, our teachers and staff and our leadership team led by Superintendent Kolaski, they have basically given up their summer um, to prepare for our school year. We know spring was a challenge. It was a tremendous challenge for all of us and something none of us, I don't think any of us 
maybe Director D'Souza, but none of us saw coming in terms of a, in terms of a worldwide pandemic. Um, and uh, I'm just teasing him, but, um, and, and we had to pivot really on a dime. We keep using the, um, the phrase building an airplane while flying, you know, at 30,000 feet. So um, that's what happened. We know there were a lot of frustrations and a lot of failures, but we also learned from a lot of these failures. And we believe um, that this school year, we're gonna start off the, the leadership team and, and all of the staff have been working hard to um, in professional development with regards to um, to online teaching, online learning, the um, different platforms the um, our teachers and staff are going to be using to interact with our students. Um, all of those these things are of tremendous priority. Um, and so, thank you to our parent volunteers who volunteered on learning forward teams, um, to our teachers who don't work during the summer typically who volunteered on these learning forward teams um, so we appreciate you um, thank you for your hard work um, and uh, we are grateful that you are dedicated to our students um, the final thing i want to talk about sorry i'm just looking at the clock oops i'm running over okay last thing is um, we know that parents are struggling as as director janini upton talked about child care um, the school is going to be focusing on making sure that um, anyone um, who receives free and reduced lunch continues to receive free and reduced lunch. Um, um, we are concerned first about our students' physical and emotional well-being. Um, that being said, we know that our students are healthiest when the parents supporting them are healthy too. So we have um, our PTA and PTA council is working hard to reimagine the PTA and be able to provide supports and different kinds of programming and supports um, for this school year because it's going to look so different. So um, just if you have ideas or questions with regards to what typically falls under PTA and want to get involved, please reach out to the um, leadership, the PTA leadership of your school. Um, I'm sure they would be happy to have volunteers and we'll be looking for volunteers to support and especially our parents. Um, and uh, we are grateful for their We are grateful for their Wow, does that mean? No. Someone's saying no, someone's saying yes. We are grateful for their dedication um, and support to our um, families. Um, next on the agenda and what I know a lot of you have been waiting for, I hope that information was helpful in putting all of this in perspective. Um, I'm going to defer to Director Tucker um, who's going to explain how we took the emails and questions and how we're going to present that information um, now. So Director Tucker. Thank you. So we received 26 emails with about 75 questions total. Um, we sorted them into categories and then we sorted them into topics beneath those categories and we combined them like we doubled up and just put the names next to them if, if my, maybe three people asked the same question. Um, and then we, um, we tried to pick questions that represented elementary, middle school and high school concerns. Um, and we tried to pick questions that hadn't already been answered in other meetings or in FAQs somewhere. And those of you whose questions are not being answered tonight um, the staff are already responding to some of the more specific questions and then some of the, the information that you're looking for will be added to the FAQs like after once they respond to one person they'll you know put it in the FAQ so just keep keep looking for those documents as they come out because there's a lot of answers there too. Um, plus there are the, the two um, webinars this week on um, special education and on uh, MI online so Okay, getting right to it. So I am, I am asking the questions, but these are questions that people send in. So I'm asking them on behalf of the public and then we're hoping that Superintendent Koloski and her staff can answer them. Okay, number one, what type of guidance will teachers at the middle school and high school receive regarding uniform use of Schoology? It has been mentioned that this will be improved from what was done in the spring, but how? And what about more uniform use of Seesaw at the elementary level? So yes, absolutely. The work has started on this and I am going to ask Jamie Prescott, who is um, our director in learning services, who is also um, over our uh, 
professional development. So Jamie, do you want to give a little description of some of the things that are already in play that I know you sent out to teachers this week? Absolutely. So I am blessed to work with an amazing team of instructional coaches and instructional technology coaches who have worked tirely, tirelessly over the summer to take into account the feedback from last spring, a variety of different parent and student surveys, um, staff survey data, and then input from each of the learning forward teams to then um, distill down and come up with some common expectations. The schools are still working on some of the expectations that will be supported by administrators. But as far as common professional development, we launched today um, for the first time. We've never launched um, PD early, but we launched it today, which is um, technically the first day of this um, school year um, as far as payroll goes. Um, we launched today an opportunity for all staff um, to participate in two required trainings. So every staff um, at middle and high will receive an hour training on Schoology and an hour on Zoom for common expectations, setting up classes, even, even staff who've been doing it for a long time are doing and engaging in these two required classes that have been designed and curated by our ITCs, um, Kat Kujak and Clay Lahari at the middle school and high school who worked in coordination and serving on those learning forward teams to make sure that there is consistency. So every single secondary teacher will receive those two trainings. As far as Seesaw at the elementary and Google Classroom in 3.5, same thing goes. Kara Millsap, Julie Hovind have been working and have posted and every elementary teacher will receive a required training in their learning management system and in Zoom. And then it will be reinforced and supported by building administrators during the other professional development that occurs at the beginning of the year. Principles, are there things that you want to add on in terms of what conversations you've had with your learning forward teams? Yeah, so in our learning forward team, we talked a lot about this um, and much of our feedback throughout the spring um, and summer has been around consistency of expectations in communication um, of how families can access and find um, what the tasks are, what the assessments are, what kids need to do. So we developed a subgroup of volunteer staff and from there um, developed a template that every single one of our teachers, we also have launched some asynchronous um, professional development as of today. So all of our teachers will receive a training on the template that was created by the staff and it will be a linked template and a pacing guide. So um, it will have what the tasks are, what the learning steps are, and then what the opportunities for um, assessment for, for those learning tasks are. And every single thing will be linked. So every family will be able to count on um, the same template from every one of their six teachers uh, and so it will be super consistent it will have it will be published similarly and um, that will all link back into Schoology so we're real excited about this um, opportunity to add consistency for our um, both our staff our students and our families so we think it's going to be a real benefit and building off of it Oh, uh, speaking for the elementary, we also have some subgroups of uh, different groups of people who are coming together to talk about both the delivery of the, the assignments and the asynchronous tools or um, tasks that students will complete following the initial instruction. Um, and so we've got a group of, of folks working on, again, a consistent delivery model. And one of the things that we talked about is, is part of that charge is thinking about, um, is it something that's going to have ease of use for teachers so that we can be consistent um, with our educators, but also ease of use for kids and ease of use for parents. So that's a focus of that group. We also have a subgroup that's working on um, the Zoom uh, side of the house and thinking about consistent ways to engage kids so that they've got that predictability of expectation and that teachers, parents, and students kind of all know what to expect for those live Zoom models. So again, we're looking for that predictability and consistency for all of our um, stakeholders. On the high school level, uh, wanted, I've asked Nick Wold, one of our associate principals, to share some of the work they're doing. I want to give a couple of uh, perspectives though. First, we certainly understand the challenge that a 14 to 18 year old, if not anybody, faces in changing classes seven times a day and having seven different models uh, to work from. So we are working diligently to make sure that those are consistent. 
Tomorrow morning, we will be meeting with our Learning Forward team and sharing out our subgroup work. It's going to include the work with what we're calling tech expectations, also with attendance and engagement. Uh, we're finished with the scheduling piece. And last but not least, uh, also working on, I just blew, drew a blank there. Nick, brought, I'll let you help me out there and just a second on what I just forgot. We're gonna be publishing that to our community by Monday, by video and document. And also uh, we will be uh, posting a web page in the next week so that people can follow updates on COVID. Nick, thank you, sir. I was going to build off of what Mary Jo said earlier, part of our path of, of our tech expectations at the high school was to really have um, a family that had students in multiple buildings to have a similar interface for consistency. So if they were to go into Schoology, they're going to get a chance to see, see, uh, see something very similar um, with their seventh grade student that they would see with their sophomore as well. Um, so they're easily navigating Schoology in a way that, that they can find the information relevant to their learners. So, um, we thought that was an important piece and in, in working with Clay Lottery, who supports both buildings as our ITC. Um, we really think that's going to be a valuable addition for families and for students. That's great. Does anyone have anything to add? Nope. Okay, I'm going to keep it going because we've got eight of these questions and I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to all of them. Um, next question. Is red online all year? also an option at the middle school and high school level? If so, when will more information be coming out about that, including sign up deadlines and, and sign up procedures? And then there's a follow up question to that, which is if a family chooses red online all year and later school does adopt an orange or yellow learning plan, can the family then switch back to the zoned learning plan? So red learning is of course our remote and it's what we are starting in for all of our classrooms. It's how our classrooms, it's what our classrooms are going to be um, come September and it is going to be set up with classes that can then um, hopefully be able to do some transitioning into some in-person. We heard a great interest, particularly from our elementary folks um, all along the way. We heard back in the spring from parents who before we even closed were expressing a concern about having their child come back in the building and so that actually led us to um, go down the path of an ALE an alternative learning experience for kids where they wouldn't be in buildings and more on that later um, and you'll have a whole webinar on that if you want to attend red learning we knew we had to create a robust learning model that would serve all of our students um, or per potentially some of our students if as this pandemic continues and pivots, we need to be able to pivot as well. So if we get to a point where we are somewhat open, we might have to pull back and close um, some, some schools, some classes, some sections. And so we want to be able to pivot to that red with consistent classes. Um, I'm going to let Fred address the, um, is it an option for our middle and high school and, and give an explanation of, of why that is. Thanks, Superintendent Kowalski. Um, one of the challenges uh, at the middle school and high school, of course, is that our students are uh, attending several classes throughout the day, um, up to seven uh, at the high school and six at the middle school. And so um, the difference really in why we opened up the red as an all day option um, to the extent possible by the district for elementary is because those students are in a cohort all day long with their teacher. And so with more predictability, we can potentially and I'll be meeting with the elementary principals on Thursday to review the information that our families have sent back. But it's much easier, easier to create those cohorts by grade level at the elementary. Um, at the high school, it's much more challenging because students have different schedules. So the red remote learning uh, really isn't available in the same way for, our, for uh, middle school and high school. Um, and so it really goes back to, we've always had what we call web classes and those are our uh, uh, World Wide Web or online classes. Um, we've shifted that for our, for our high school and our middle school to call it My Online. And so students who are really looking for a peer online option, um, that would be handled through My Online. We're encouraging all families, K through 12, especially since we are starting in a red remote environment anyway, to take advantage of the awesome teachers and the um, incredible changes that we've made since last spring to really enhance our programming. 
but we know some families have have already notified us that they're reluctant that um, they don't really want their students to return um, to class even if they're even if we do have that option so unfortunately at the middle school and high school we just can't uh, make that same option even available Oops. thank you for that explanation okay question number three at the high school level what is going on with AP classes, honors classes, and lab sciences? What type of arrangements, if any, are being made so that these can take place? Will any AP classes be available on my online? And finally, will any graduation requirements be changed for the class of 2022? That's like five questions. That is a lot of questions. <laughs> graduation requirements, um, not as of yet. We know that there was waivers that we were, uh, that we applied for, for some students for um, 2020 graduates. We will continue to monitor to see how that um, does play out for all of our senior class. Paul, watch with us so we know what's happening for students. We do anticipate there, there, that there could be potentially some um, waivers for students as needed, but right now it is still the, the 24 credits as we are always um, used to. Um, AP classes, on my online, Fred, you want to address that? There are AP classes available through my online. Um, we again are are encouraging our families to to take advantage of our teachers. Um, many of the classes for my online, um, you know, will likely be taught by one of our partner uh, providers and not by an MI teacher. Um, and so, while they're available. Um, it may not be in the same cohort with other students or they might be with other students, but there are, there's a small selection of AP classes. Um, it's certainly not as wide and robust as, as the catalog is at Mercer on High School. And the first part of the question, so we kind of answered them in reverse order about um, at the high school level, what about AP and honors classes um, and lab services? Yes, we will um, still have those even in remote learning. And I know that our, our high school is working with particularly our teachers who teach these classes in how will we um, accommodate and modify for those classes. Nick, do you wanna expand any more on that? I'll talk specifically about science because they've been on this since February. Um, they've been actively discussing this in their department and working as, as collaborative teams to create a ro robust, lab experience outside of the in-person uh, mode. Um, so your bi biology, your chemistry, your physics, all of them will still have lab opportunities and AP offerings, but they may, it just may look a little bit different um, using online modules. Um, many of the, our science teachers put our administrative team at ease by saying, hey, we've got this and we're gonna make this incredible for our learners. And so they've been actively doing this since this past spring. And so they foresaw this based on safety and they've been working on this since since the early parts of COVID last year. So I'm excited about this opportunity, uh, to be honest. Okay, great, thank you. Question number four, what can families expect in terms of a timeline for getting IEPs and assessments for special services scheduled? Will these services be provided in, in person at school buildings since there seems to be some confusion about that? And what does by appointment only mean in this context for the same reason? So I'm going to let Dr. Booby answer those questions. Thank you, Donna. Um, so I'm happy to. Um, so we have already started um, in-person uh, evaluations uh, for special services. We started that on August 3rd. Families have been contacted. There is a backlog. Our uh, psychologists have volunteered to continue working through their summer break um, to uh, meet with families and to write those reports. Um, so our priority is the families we didn't get to back in March, April, May, June, and, and so we're working on that backlog and now, and then we'll be working on our students who are new to our district to make sure that they're coming in with an evaluation that we can serve on day one. Um, IEP meetings will be starting soon, so I, I know we want dates. Um, our staff of our most significant learners and some of our youngest learners like ECSE, uh, the teachers will start making phone calls to parents the week of the 17th. IEP meetings will happen the week of the 24th. Some teachers may be able to pull those teams together sooner. Um, the big question that I'm hearing is what is appointment services? That really depends on your student. Um, an ATP student who um, can wear a mask and can be out uh, on a job site might be able to work for three or four hours at a time. But a preschooler, 
um, may it might be appropriate for an hour. So we are working with uh, each of the IEP teams individually. Um, we'll have some ideas of what might be typical for a student at that age level, but because it's individually determined, uh, we are not locking our students into this is the only thing you get. And I don't think parents would want, um, my hope is parents wouldn't want that. They want individualized attention and decisions, and that's what we're gonna try to do. Um, we do have, um, several webinars coming up next week. We have uh, the FAQ, the general one, on Wednesday the 19th. And on Monday next week, parents will be getting an email that outlines all the additional webinars. So our PLP teachers are gonna be hosting something, our ATP staff is hosting something, our preschool. So we're gonna have some very specific uh, times for parents to reach out and talk to um, each uh, specific group. And so that all will be coming out in email with all the links uh, ready to go. That is really helpful to know about. Thank you. Okay, question number five about attendance. For elementary school, are only the three basic time blocks mandatory or will attendance also be taken in the specialist subjects? What happens if kindergartners are absent from class? And slightly related, for the high school, is attendance mandatory at the two Islander hour meetings? So I'll start by talking a little bit about attendance. You know, in um, elementary school, we take attendance on a daily basis, and that's how we monitor how our students are attending. Do we need to check on those families? And it is also how um, our, our funding alloc is allocated as well. So we are certainly going to be checking on our students um, throughout the day in the blocks, and we want our teachers to be aware of that because that for us is going to be a signal Does a student and thereby their family need some other support? So um, if parents are struggling with their child for long periods of time on, on screen We don't want them to worry. There's no penalty. It is not punitive Reach out to your child's teacher and work through a, a plan when we're in um, red learning as to what's best going to meet your child's needs. We um, will be doing similar in our high school and middle school as well. Certainly, yes, we have period attendance and that is how our funding is allocated. But we, uh, we also want to be touching base with the students who aren't there, that aren't engaged, so that we can make sure that they're okay and what else can we um, do to support them. Um, the two Islander hour meetings a week. I'm going to have to ask Nick about that or maybe Jeff's going to talk. Yeah, I can take yeah. that. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, Islander Hour uh, two times a week is a great opportunity for our staff to connect with our students, to build relationships, build connections. Um, and so, yes, it is going to be mandatory, but we want our students there. and We want our students to want to be there as well. So we're looking forward to, to opening arms and, and virtually and having our kids uh, present with us so that they can participate in various either grade level activities that might be um, college counseling, you know, pr pr planning type things, um, might be social, emotional, and, and team building. Um, those kinds of things will be provided. Um, we're also talking about um, some ways to help students with, so, uh, with uh, organization too. So lots of different things that we wanna have regular contact with our students uh, virtually so that we can check in and make sure we can support them. Thank you very Just much. to make sure we cover everything, Fred, was there anything we missed in attendance? Oh, no, the, I, um, think, I, think that, I think that covers it. And there, the teams are finalizing some of the, you know, final parameters people want, you know, tight boundaries. But we have to remind everyone that attendance isn't always about just being there. It's also about being present and engaging. And I think we had a lot of success last year really encouraging our students um, and our staff was encouraging students to be present and we're having a lot of those conversations. Sorry, how about the specialist subjects for at the elementary level? Are those also going to have attendance taken? I can address that. Um, you know, we, we think every part of the day is really important. We hope students are engaged throughout the day. But if we have, you know, a class with 60 people in a, in a specialty area, we're not going to spend a lot of time <laughs> going to make sure We'll, we'll notice, maybe we'll see some things people will reach out, but we really want students to enjoy it without spending a lot of time at the end of the day taking attendance. And like um, Superintendent Kolosky mentioned, uh, we really just want to support families. And again, we hope they reach out to us as administrators if they're, if they're having some struggles and we'll have those individual conversations. Thank you, Principal Hoffman. Um, 
Next question, number six, can someone please explain how switching in and out of my online would work? Can it only be done at a semester break? How would students adjust to what are presumably different course materials in the middle of the year if they switch between models? And finally, who decides what classes a child will be enrolled in if they're doing my online? Go, Fred. <laughs> so Jamie and I will spend uh, more time on this tomorrow night um, because uh, we're going to host that webinar uh, tomorrow and we'll go into this in greater detail. Just quickly, I know Jamie's been working with the high school counselors and principals um, this week on talking about classes and enrollment at the high school in particular because there are graduation implications. Um, the counselors need to be involved in those conversations with families and students. Um, to be sure that if a student is taking an online class, they're taking one that's gonna fulfill not just any requirement for graduation, but they have to be thinking about their high school and beyond plan. Um, and so at the middle and high school, the counselor role is critical. Um, our middle school counselors as well wanna be sure we're enrolling students in the right um, core academics as well. Um, thinking about some of the other questions just quickly, um, switching in and out of my online is kind of like changing your kid from one school district to another or from one school to another. There isn't a way to guarantee that there's going to be seamless transition if a student takes the first part of biology in the first semester online and then wants to come because we're able to come back to school is going to rejoin that biology class at the high school. Um, you know, there are going to be some, some overlaps in terms of content. Um, but we deal with this with students moving from different schools in the middle of a school year. But I think families really need to think about um, that when you're making a commitment to online learning, you're kind of making a commitment to a school. And therefore, there is a time period and the best transitions are at those grading periods, not just in the middle. Some of our online partners um, don't allow enrollment after a certain date um, and others do. So we'd have to work with families. But again, not all of the credits will, will match up either. So Jamie and I will go into greater detail about this tomorrow, but um, thinking about my online again is kind of like enrolling in a different school um, within the school district. And I'm sorry if you said this and I missed it, but yep. how, who decides what classes an elementary school child would be enrolled in? Um, typically the provider, if, if we're able to offer it as a school district, um, we'll have our own teacher who would be teaching, but more than likely with MI Online, we'd likely be partnering with one of our partners um, and we'd be assigning a student to one of the partners based on space availability. Um, they really focus on reading, writing, and math. There are some science and social studies and they really don't um, do the specialists at all with, with, with our partners. Um, and so, but reading, writing, math, the core is really where they focus their attention. Okay, thank you. We have time for just one more question. So I'm gonna ask question number seven. Since March, how has the district taken parent feedback into account? So we, uh, let's just start with email. We received a lot of emails and they all have been read um, and answered when we can, sent if there are um, things that specific uh, administrators can answer, we've sent them to those and we're continuing to do that even with some of the ones that were recently sent. We had a survey and we, we did more than one survey. We did lots of surveys and we took all the feedback, particularly from our crisis mode that we went into in March to pivot our system and close our schools. And we listened to our parents, we listened to our students, and we heard loud and clear the pieces that didn't work for families and students and what they really were looking for um, in a remote learning model. Things that um, we clearly heard were more synchronous learning um, daily for students, and that's why the red models have been built the way they had. We definitely heard um, consistency in the student platforms and ease of usability and having kids, parents, and teachers having things in the same place so that everyone could find them. Um, the new specifications about uh, FaceTime, being able to see each other, um, creating, we heard way back early on, you know, we, we don't want to come back. We're looking for um, an online model similar to um, the Washington Virtual Academy, but I really want to stay in Mercer Island. That was how my online was, was created. Um, we are considering the red learning option for our elementary kids. We heard loud and clear when we surveyed parents and in a lot of emails that, gosh, you know, 
is it possible to do this? And so we are investigating that. We're collecting the information on it. We do have to have enough students to um, move a, a teacher into a red learning all year model. And we are not sure if we're there yet, but we are collecting that data and hope to have um, more information on that later. Um, parents were on all of our learning forward committees along with staff. We continue to work with um, our PTA and reaching out to them on a regular basis and um, really just continue to get the feedback, listen to it, do what we can to pivot, try to respond to um, the pieces that are overarching for all. We know that there's lots of individual concerns and we continue to encourage you, as President Larry said at the beginning, to reach out to your um, individual school sites for support if you have a question or concern that's specific to your student. I just wanted to say thank you all for your responses. I think that was very helpful. And um, Director Tucker, thank you so much for collecting them and paraphrasing them and um, getting, getting that out in such a um, direct way. Um, we are, oh, 631. All right, so where I knew we were coming up. Last thing I wanna say is we will get back to school when our community as a whole wears masks. Please, please, please wear masks. Encourage especially your teenagers to wear masks. Um, Morgan and Paul, please encourage your buddies to wear masks and abide by the six foot distance. We all want our students back in school and that is the way it's gonna happen. Um, and until then, we are here for you. Our um, administration team, our administrative team is amazing. Our teachers are amazing. If we can't solve the problem, we will do everything we can to help. We have, um, as you know, the community partners with MIYFS, with um, the Schools Foundation, Boys and Girls Club, JCC. Um, there's some other private organizations that are providing support during the day, especially for working parents. Um, and, and frankly, our, our great community of people who are willing to step up and help their neighbor. So um, please don't suffer in silence. Reach out to us if you have concerns. We know there's gonna be issues. Just please don't suffer in silence and let us um, point you in the right direction or offer suggestions and solutions, um, which we will do as we have them. So thank you everyone for your time. Uh, appreciate your hard work um, and look forward to um, seeing many of you at our um, regularly scheduled board meeting tomorrow. So, all right, have a good night, everyone. Oh, good, okay, thank you.